Hey, thank you, Abhijit, for that uh, generous introduction. I'm very pleased to be here in Redlands. Uh, I, I'm from University College Dublin, which is the largest university in Ireland, and the University College Dublin Business School is the largest business school um, in Ireland, and where we, uh, one of the things that we've been, I've been involved with really over the years is on the quantitative end of things. Uh, <coughs> Originally, I was called Operations Research and Management Science, and now it's uh, called Business Analytics. And so I'm with the UCD Centre of Business Analytics, uh, and as I, I've been head of that group for three years, and my sentence haven't been served. Uh, I, I get to do a bit of research for a change, and part of that takes me to California, where I'm visiting the Irvine campus of Pepperdown. So I had the opportunity to come here to Redlands to talk. And really, this is the presentation this evening is as much to raise questions as to answer them. And I don't think I have necessarily the answer to, to the issues that I'm uh, talking about, but I hope that it can raise some issues um, in discussion and so on, and then we can see the different perspectives that might exist on these, uh, on these matters. So, as the introduction said, I started off uh, sort, of, sort of makes me feel old in one sense. 30 years ago, when I did my, my master's degree, I was doing routing problems. And of course, routing problems uh, require some kind of map on which to conduct the route. And we were using fairly crude and simplified sort of versions of the, the road network, a bit like what you see in the, in the diagram uh, there in order to do that. And when you're applying these kind of quantitative techniques uh, to any type of problem, it be in space or otherwise, there are two things really that need to, you need to get right. You need to ensure that the model, that you're, mod that the mod you're using a model of the world. The, the danger and the, the reason why many of these things have failed it has been that the model applied has been an oversimplification of reality and people have applied oversimplified models and drawn conclusions from those models which aren't warranted because the conclusion is correct by reference to the model, but it's not correct by reference to the more complex situation which exists in reality. So therefore, people are using simplified models. <coughs> and why did they do that? Well, they did that, especially in, when I started, people did use simplified models because the computer wasn't big enough, uh, it continues using simplified models because it makes life a bit easier for you if you use a simplified model. <clears throat> but also, one of the reasons why people have simplified models is because the data inputs required for complex models are not available, and so they have to make do with what they have, which may be a simplification of the world. <clears throat> so the second issue that arises is, <clears throat> do we have... Uh, but realistic and representative data on which to apply a model. So coming from the uh, analytics background, uh, I feel myself competent to assess whether I'm doing the modeling right. That's something which perhaps not everybody has that, that capability, but, but you can, it's down to the modeler to assess the, the capability of their own model, but the, the ability of the modeler to control the sources of data is much less because the data may have to come from other people and other sources and limitations in the data may be those which are not obvious to the person who's conducting the analysis because they didn't collect the data, they don't even know the person who collected the data and in a sense that's something in the process over which they have little control. So the obvious problem is the data isn't available and certainly in the 1980s uh, when I started, that was the case. There weren't the digital databases of maps that now exist. <coughs> we basically had to uh, build our own from taking paper maps and digitizing them. Uh, and that process was extremely labor intensive and also somewhat error prone in the sense that we were collecting the data the first time and nobody else had actually used it. So there hadn't been any uh, process of elimination of bugs and so on. The bugs are still there uh, and so that was a, a real issue. We can have a situation where the data is available but we can't afford it and that's a, a common problem. So the perspective I have tonight is one of a person in the business school. And 
perhaps a majority perspective, there are perspectives on the availability of data, <coughs> and that, it's, that it's there, but there also is a question is, is can we actually afford it? And the affordability of data uh, has been something which has been a major problem and which has <coughs> led to various difficulties arising. <coughs> the data may be oversimplified, in the sense that we have data which is not, uh, which is, so even let's say the road network represented in the, the thing, you know, it, it leaves out the, the detail of the road. That may or may not be uh, a problem for a particular application at hand. For the case of booting, it's actually not, not, not too bad. <coughs> but the simplifications in data, you need to be at least be clear as to what those simplifications are and understand the limitations which that imposes on what you're trying to do. <coughs> And the data may be claim wrong, which of course is, is, uh, <coughs> happens, and it certainly did happen in the past, more than now in the sense that, that the first time we approach data, nobody else has used it, the errors have not yet been ironed out in any sense from that. So really my work has been with spatial decision support systems, and <coughs> spatial decision support systems <coughs> are specific systems, you know, for a great deal of, of data in the geographic sphere is, is, is general to the extent that it's, it's, it's intended for use in a variety of different applications. It covers a geography in which there may be multiple activities taking place. Decision support, though, is concerned with very specific things. I want to make a decision. That decision requires specific relevant uh, subsets of data in order to proceed. <coughs> and uh, so therefore, generalities of data are fine, but unless you have the specific things that you're going to need for your uh, application, then you have a problem. And just to give two sort of uh, more stories, if you like, of things, projects which I was involved in, which, which failed, essentially, because of data, in a sense. <coughs> uh, at that time, we were doing a lot of routing work with the Irish Post Office. As uh, the introduction said, my PhD was concerned with uh, arc routing problems, which is uh, Post delivery problems, and I, I used the data from that earlier work really as a, to inspire me for, for the academic research. <clears throat> but in that project, <clears throat> when we're dealing with a, a real organisation, there are many, there are people in that organisation who are very keen on what we're trying to do, and there are other people who are not keen on what we're trying to do, who perhaps think that it was better that we didn't do it, or that it should be done some other way, or uh, whatever. <clears throat> And one of the things which happened in reality was that, that one of the, the leverages which, these, which people who were opposed to what we were trying to do that were, were able to bring to the problem was the fact that certain outputs from our, our analysis were wrong because the actual data going in was wrong. So if there was a road, uh, a non-existent road in a sense which was incorporated in our, in our input data, then we get, a, we get a route which goes along a non-existent road on the output which is easily derided and, and scorned at in some sense by those, by, if somebody's not that keen on your project. <clears throat> and it's not, okay, it, perhaps it is our fault up to a certain extent, but it, 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 the origin of the data lay with other, other people other than ourselves. But you know, going on to say, well, that's not our fault, it's somebody else's fault, isn't really, doesn't really cut it if people are actually looking for an excuse to discontinue uh, your project. So, and, and that led to other things happening. <clears throat> Later in the decade, uh, I was involved in a project with, uh, for, for carpooling, which is something which has had some uh, ideas have been floated in California for this. <clears throat> and the carpooling application, we were doing this with uh, Intel Ireland, in fact, who had a big plant, and a lot of people drove there in the morning, and they, they generally couldn't be parked, and so on. <clears throat> and we designed a model which would actually uh, uh, match up people who might be travelling the same way in the, in the morning. <clears throat> and what we needed really for this, to, to make this particular uh, project a success, was uh, <clears throat> actual data in the sense of a map uh, uh, on which people could identify where they lived. Now, I might say, in 2015, that's not a problem. There was no problem whatsoever. You know, there's Google Maps and so on. You can click on the screen and say, this is where I live. Google Maps hadn't been invented in 1987 when we tried to do this. And the actual uh, licensing of data to display it on the screen in such a way that it could be made available for this project was such a complicated and expensive pr 
process that it, it certainly led to the delay of the project and eventually meant that it, it, the project went on a road, not, not only because of that, but that had it been possible to finish it in a timely way, it, it wouldn't have uh, had that problem. So <coughs> the actual, the modeling thing is something that we can do, the data thing is something that we don't always have complete uh, control over, unfortunately, ourselves. And the reason why spatial data in business is kind of unusual is that most businesses don't deal with other people's data. Most of the data business uses is their own data. People tend to have customer management systems and so on, and they look at data of their own customers, and they don't use, in general, a very large amount of data from outside the organization. Okay, perhaps they, they look at economic indicators or that kind of thing. <clears throat> but in many companies, there's not a great uh, deal of, of data from outside the organization uh, in their systems. But when it comes to spatial data, because everybody shares the same geography, you know, the, the motor dealer, the restaurant, <clears throat> uh, they're all in the same street. They don't, they don't all you know, build their own data set. They actually buy one from somebody else. They, they use, there's a common geography and a common set of data, so you, buy, you obtain the data from somebody else and use it. But that's a little bit unusual in the business context, and it leads to certain issues which are not. Uh, people have control and, and, and perhaps some understanding of the provenance of their own data. They don't have that control uh, over the data, which is spatial, because they can't really, it's not economic to do it themselves, and it comes from somewhere else, which of course brings in additional issues. And in general, uh, there are network effects with many types of technology. So if you have a, 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 an application on your phone, if you have WhatsApp or something, it, it, it works best. If all your friends have WhatsApp as well, and you can actually communicate with them. Uh, there are situations in which the, the, the number of different combinations, the uh, number of different connections possible, uh, make up the value of the application. And likewise, with spatial data, <coughs> If you have, there are many different types of data, and different combinations of these types of data can answer questions which perhaps people hadn't thought of before. So that if you're interested in location analysis, you might want to know things like traffic volumes, things like availability of power supplies, things like uh, water, water availability, and so on. Uh, what's the population who can commute to your potential investment that you might want to make there? All of this type of data is different forms of data coming from different locations, coming from different organizations, but the combination of it can be extremely powerful. And in business, <clears throat> we're not concerned so much with the underlying geographic structure of things. We're concerned with, obviously, the economic impact of that, and that requires the economic layers, if you like, in the data set <clears throat> and data from different sources. So uh, we really do need to have a lot of different people providing data sets. Uh, and with that, we can do things which perhaps the people who collected the data never envisaged. And in a sense, we may never have envisaged this until we saw the sets of data that were available and then realized perhaps that we could combine these and some, to answer some uh, useful question in a decision support system context. So, are we going to make, is all data going to become available to everyone? But the nature of things is that data isn't generally made available to everyone. People have commercial ownership of data in a sense. Even governments have a sense of uh, signalization in, in, within organizations that even within government there isn't always very good sharing of data between different departments and different parts of government so that they don't, they do their own thing. People collect data on one purpose and they use it. The motor vehicles collect the data on the one motor vehicles. Uh, somebody else knows about the water supply. Somebody else knows about uh, the population and so on. It's not necessarily clear that these people uh, see that they should share their data because they see the reason why they collected it. They use it for that purpose, but they don't necessarily see the downstream uh, possibilities arising from uh, other combinations of this data which are uh, not, not obvious at the beginning. And attitudes to, to sharing data differ internationally. Uh, some societies have a kind of collective uh, public spirit of the view of the world, maybe in Scandinavia or whatever. Other places have a more commercial uh, thing where you know, visitors organizations building their own commercial data sets and 
uh, fighting it out in the marketplace rather than actually sharing it in a kind of a public spirited way. <clears throat> the history of, of countries differs. The types of organizations to hold data differ. Uh, for historical reasons, you can have particular setups in, in different countries which differ from one to the other. <clears throat> By and large, none of these are entirely um, conducive to uh, the sharing of data, so that these combinations of data, which are very powerful, may not actually come into existence in practice. So we have the traditional kind of government organizations, we have the mapping agencies, uh, and in, in many countries these are, have, for example in Ireland, there was a comprehensive survey of the country that was done between 1820 and 1840, using uh, thousands of people with sort of poles and so on going around the countryside measuring it, and th those maps even when you compare them today to the GPS are extremely accurate and extremely, uh, extremely good, <coughs> and that, that's a huge kind of historical data set that's available, <clears throat> and this exists in many countries. In other European countries, they have a strong tradition of property registers and uh, keeping information on, 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 on plots of land and so on. <clears throat> and likewise, other public authorities, such as uh, road authorities, have roads, and then other people have sewers and water and so on. And, and defence authorities have had uh, reason to collect data and often access to technology to do that. <clears throat> so all of these people have uh, a lot of data, but the extent to which they work well together is actually not uh, always as good as it might be. So then we have the private data collection people. Now, we've had a number of these that have changed name over the years and so on and, and merged into different uh, organizations. <clears throat> but we have had several people surveying the world. <clears throat> uh, and so that the, the people that built the, when I came here to California, I actually bought a sat-nav, and uh, so thereby buying into a database, in a sense, with somebody who collected, which would help me get around, and, and uh, so on. So these, these organizations have built up big databases, and they've done so in two, two ways. One is an obvious survey, which is not so different from traditional agencies. They've sent somebody around deliberately trying to collect data, but also, <clears throat> they've had you, the public, provide you, provide them with data in the sense that <clears throat> all of us have mobile phones and things of that nature. Every time we use these things, people are able to collect data from us, and they're bringing that data into uh, commercial databases uh, from which uh, they provide services, and those services are extremely useful, but nevertheless, <clears throat> uh, the data falls into a commercial organization and therefore will seek to uh, charge for its use and would not necessarily be making it available again for some kind of combination purpose which might be desirable. Uh, <clears throat> and then, last we have the, we have the, crowd, the community model. Now, obviously, we have certain user communities, people who, for one reason or another, collect data <clears throat> so that, that different sports organizations will collect data on their playing fields so that the other team can find their can find the facilities and so on. And you could have uh, fish, fishing organizations might, might document rivers in order to know where to go to fish. <clears throat> and we've had more recently the, the, the sort of crowdsourcing of volunteer geographic information which is collecting large amounts of data <clears throat> by people who are contributing to the public domain without necessarily seeking a direct uh, response from them. <clears throat> So we, we've had three sort of historical sets of, of data building, but the chance of these things coming together is uh, somewhat limited. <coughs> so we want to measure data, somebody has to collect it, which means that they have to find it worthwhile to do so. <coughs> and many people collect data because they themselves need it, and so you can get it from them as a byproduct almost. They have to want to make it available, which is it's not obvious why they would want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, a commercial organization is in the business of making money, not necessarily in the business of uh, doing good works. Mm -hmm. They may wish to make that available for reasons of, uh, of reputation or something like that, but it, it's not that, that's not uh, the case in most cases. Mm -hmm. Users have to be able to find it, and users have to be able to use it. There has been a good deal of work on the, on the latter part of these things, in the sense that the technical end of things can be dealt with. You can actually have very large databases, 
you can have some kinds of meta structures which allow you to find things. <clears throat> it's a lot of work, it's not necessarily finished, but that technicalities can be overcome, that's the, that's the thing. The problem is, to my mind, is number two, is why, you know, when we don't necessarily live in an altruistic world, <clears throat> what's in it for me, in the sense of I have a lot of data uh, to make it available to somebody else, because even the process of making it available, if I put it into some kind of overall database so people can find it, and I'm required to document it, I'm required to provide some kind of uh, meta, meta information about it and so on, that's trouble for me. So why do I want to do that? What's, what's the actual... Uh, so I think the business school perspective of this is what is the, the marketplace, if you like, for data rather than uh, what is the technical issues in integrating it because the technical issues, while they're sub substantial, will in fact be overcome over time. <coughs> so I think the interest in some of the geographical community can be sometimes in the technical issues, but that's only half the battle. You can do things, <coughs> but it doesn't necessarily mean that that uh, things will actually work, or, to, or that the, the economics of things will actually be effective. So, <clears throat> I can bring my, my cell phone here to California, it does work, but the economics of using it aren't very attractive in terms of my Irish service provider, <clears throat> so in fact I, I don't tend to use it very much because it doesn't actually make economic sense to do that. So, <clears throat> in a similar situation with that, if you like, whereby um, the technical issues can be overcome, but the, the economic ones are going to be the ones that are going to cause us the problem in the medium term. <clears throat> so the SDI literature, they've had concerns with these kinds of issues. <clears throat> they said, well, we need to have better models of governance, we need to have an organizational culture, cultural change <clears throat> and organizational structures, and we need a new platform to facilitate access to, to this. So the, the platform is definitely work is required on that, but work is ongoing to achieve that. So the as I said, the technicalities can always be overcome. Uh, it takes a little bit of time. <clears throat> Organizational cultures will only change if the organization feels that there's a reason to try and achieve that change so that the organization at the top level needs to see some advantage in doing this. And that advantage is not always clear. <clears throat> uh, if you think of think about your university, you know the actual uh, levels of of sharing in the sense between the school of engineering and the school of business or you know whatever medicine these things. You know, people do their own thing and they, they don't necessarily uh, even in terms of I was speaking to a lady from the library service here in Redlands while we were setting up and <clears throat> about the issues of the university getting licensing for spatial data <clears throat> and the sure situation where the School of Engineering and the, the School of Architecture didn't both get the same license for the same set of data independently of each other uh, without sort of at least making some effort to share that or to negotiate a common license with the, with the, with the, with the provider. <clears throat> Within the, within, within the single university, that, that proves quite difficult, and the situation is much more difficult in general as to what is the economic structure that can lead, lead to this kind of coordination taking place. So the, the government is the one place to start. They have a lot of traditional data, and the difference here is obviously the taxpayer funded versus cost recovery model. Now, traditionally here in the US, government took the view that the data was paid for by the taxpayer and should be made available to the taxpayer, while generally speaking other countries uh, in the past uh, took the view that this data was kind of expensive to collect and that the money, government money was needed for schools or something like that and that we should actually uh, try and fund the school and, and try and uh, charge people for the data. <clears throat> and the consequence of this was of course that GIS developed much more quickly in the US than it did in other developed countries <coughs> because of the fact that the data was widely available. <coughs> it took time in Europe for, for data to become available for the, the sort of the uh, flowering of different GIS applications to take place because that could only take place when there was a, a data set available at a price which people could afford which creates a, a rather subtle pricing problem. You go for a mass market 
and we admit that it's cheap and hope lots of people will buy it, or do you make it expensive and hope that a few people will buy it? And, and almost every sort of European government agency has kind of struggled with that and probably started off with the expensive end of things <coughs> and moved toward the, the cheaper one only later, thereby hindering uh, the development of GIS in many places. There are places which haven't, didn't have a big historical legacy of data, and these people have the advantage, perhaps, of starting off with a, a white page in terms of how, uh, how things are to be structured. <coughs> uh, I did some, some work out in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, where they've started a uh, spatial data infrastructure program, which has been, 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 been a, an exemplar, in many ways, of, it, of its uh, of, of its type, and that's with uh, GPC, who also have uh, heritage in, in here in, in, in Southern California. <coughs> but they have actually a situation where they're only building these things now, and the government has uh, considerable influence in that economy, so the government's able to say everybody shall put the data into the SDI, and so <coughs> that's happening, and they're doing things in a very with the benefit of hindsight, because they started a little bit later than other countries, they're looking at other examples and seeing what went wrong, what went right, and able to do things in a better way, so they're, they're able to do a very good job. The question is, though, can the traditional uh, sort of setup, which has a number of different silos, can they successfully reorientate themselves toward this kind of sharing model? <coughs> The thing that's coming on with this is the actual open data concept. So at the G7 meeting, uh, the major governments of the world promised to make a lot of data freely available, and that included spatial data. <coughs> uh, so in theory, lots of spatial data should be now available, and some progress has been made on this front. <coughs> I know that I have looked at some of these data sets and they're there in some sense, but you can't actually use them because they're not well structured in a way that makes them accessible. But however, that may well be, be addressed. <coughs> One of the issues is, for, for instance, in, 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 in Britain, the <coughs> mapping agency, the Ordnance Survey, which is one of the more sort of uh, developed and traditional mapping agencies, <coughs> they were very much against this idea of uh, open data because they felt that they'd be required to make the data freely available, but that nobody would give them the extra budget to actually uh, compensate them for the loss of the sale of that data so that th their, their actual budget would simply decline. So at the moment they have a government budget, they also sell a lot of data, they make a lot of money from selling the data and are therefore able to update it and so on. In this free data world, the actual uh, <coughs> won't be able to sell it because they'll have to give it away and will the government then provide them with uh, enough budget to maintain it and update it and keep, keep it current and so on in a situation where they're not actually getting any revenue stream. They felt that they wouldn't get that, that, that flow of money. So you could have a situation where the quality of data could be compromised by the, the fact that it's been given away free because there isn't any sort of flow of resources to ensure it's, it's uh, updated. <coughs> so in terms of the models, uh, <coughs> obviously we've got license fees, we've got subscription fees, we can, we can, these are capable of being applied to the actual transfer of source data. And that somebody can give you, a, a, the old days, a CD, and nowadays you download something and you pay them some money and the data kind of arrives in your computer. Uh, <coughs> and in the, you can have a subscription fee where the updates also come. So if you can get, you, uh, on my sat nav, I bought the North American maps, but I, it, I only get updates uh, for two years or something, <coughs> and then I, I would have to pay uh, for, for those subsequently, which is <coughs> a subscription fee model to some extent. <coughs> There's a problem with that, that, of course, I still have the data after subscription ends and, and uh, in many cases, and the, the, if the rules don't change much, that may not be a, a critical problem for at least a few years. Um, <coughs> Then we have these kind of services here, which really relate more to the provision of services rather than the transfer of the data itself. So you can go to a mapping website and you can look at a map and look at a and derive a route from that or something, and you know, ads can come up on the side of the screen or whatever. <coughs> and so these models are better <coughs> for the delivery of services. But the delivery of services, while they're extremely convenient, they are in some sense restricted, that the service is 
a, a limited set of things you can do. It's not the complete uh, set of possibilities that could be done with the underlying data. And so <coughs> uh, a service-driven model, while it's very appealing to the vast majority of people because it does what the vast majority of people want, uh, that other subset of people who want to do something different and combine things which are a little bit uh, unusual will find it more difficult because that wasn't envisaged when the service was designed and the service is not always capable of delivering uh, other than the mass market. Uh, so that the advertising support by definition supports the mass market model of things rather than uh, something which is more customized. <coughs> So the, the point about the commercial world is that the commercial world is <coughs> wants to make money. And so they sell the application which make money, and presumably don't bother with the application, they don't make money, but they also are a little bit careful not to give away their, their means of making money by providing something which allows perhaps some other disintermediation of their service or that kind of thing. <coughs> And one of the, the issues which has arisen in the modern world with uh, electronic services is that we're not always, we know we're paying for it, but we're not quite sure why, how exactly we're paying for it. And in most cases, we don't care. You know, the thing is there, it's free to you, in the sense we don't actually have to type in our credit card number to use it. And so, uh, but the, 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 there is an issue over there, what is the model of, of payment? And the model of payment can be, in the case of advertising and so on, we, that's fine, that's reasonably clear. But the, the other model, which is perhaps less clear, is that we are providing the data which is in the service that we're actually looking at. So, in a sense, we're giving back the data in a way, <coughs> and that data uh, is being given involuntarily, in the sense we don't know that we are providing from a mobile phone or some other device the data which is then being used to build a multi-billion dollar corporation. So I mean, various things have incentives to provide, encourage people to do this. You have you know, gamification and uh, <coughs> trying to provide entertainment in a sense by but, but, but get people to, so this is a kind of uh, GPS game if you like. We can reward points where you, your status rises up if you do something and, and provide some, something which is of value to the organization. In economic terms, and there are people here who are more familiar with economics than I, so I won't uh, say that much about it, but in a sense there is a two-sided marketplace in, in operation here because the, the service provides you with something that you want to know, um, so traffic congestion on, 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 the, on the road ahead, and you in turn provide back from data from perhaps your device, perhaps from the, the the speed that you're traveling at, which can be inferred from the movement of your device, provides the, the actual data that allows the provider to uh, determine whether or not there is traffic congestion. So there's a mutual benefit relationship going on there, and that's okay, because that's, it's fairly clear what, what, what is the, the nature of that exchange. You, know, you, say where you, you say where you are, and they say they provide something about where you are, but well, that's a reasonably clear thing. But there are other forms of uh, issues that they don't just tell you what the traffic congestion is, but they sort of know where you are all, all day, every day, and, and what are the privacy implications of that. Now, if you if you go into if you have an Android phone and you go into your Google, what is this? Reports, whatever it's called, you can see where you went if the location is turned on, and you can if you want to record your your holidays, you can look and say, oh, yeah, that day I went to here and uh, I went to the good restaurant there and so on, and that's very good, <coughs> but in some sense uh, that information is also uh, <coughs> in the database and you know, can be combined in various ways uh, to know things about you which are more than, than members of your family know about you or, or anything else. <coughs> and, and these things have, have big and bad implications. So before I left Ireland there was a, a murder case, uh, the basic uh, trust of the evidence was based on mobile phone evidence, essentially, because the, the murder had taken place two years previously, and there was no strong forensic evidence uh, because the you know, period of time had elapsed. So they couldn't actually say uh, a, a good deal about things, but they could say a lot about <coughs> mobile phone evidence. And the mobile phone evidence was to do with 
uh, an anonymous phone, a prepaid phone, <coughs> being in the same place as the person's regular work phone, which was in one pocket and the prepaid phone was in the other pocket, if you like. And both of these were in the same place at the same time, and the prepaid phone was used for certain uh, <coughs> threats were made and so on from the prepaid phone and they were able to, uh, that was the basis of the case. So, I mean, this is a good thing that people who commit murder are actually uh, caught by these things. <clears throat> but the question is, are people who are just going about their ordinary business, uh, are they also subject to a <coughs> scrutiny of like, because of this? So the, the involuntary provision of spatial data by individuals is an issue which perhaps people haven't thought that much about including myself. So, <coughs> otherwise I would turn off my phone immediately. <laughs> Uh, so then we have the, the volunteer geographic data, which there are a number of terms for this. VGI, my good child used that term, neogeography is another one, which the word geogeography been around a long time has been associated with this kind of thing. <coughs> and there's two kind of aspects of this because when you use your phone, obviously they know where you are because you have a location facility on that, <coughs> and you can use that for tracking your lost phone and that kind of thing, so that, that, that also has advantages. The, the other point is relation to apps. When you install an app on your phone, a big long list of permissions comes up. So the app, which is like playing a game or something, wants to know where you are. Now the question is why does it need to know that? And in a sense, the reason why it wants to know that is because it's collecting a lot of data which can be then given to somebody so to somebody, whatever, <coughs> uh, about what, what its customers do, and that the value of that particular sale of that data allows it to provide that game or that particular piece of whatever it might be, app, provide that to you without cost. So you're getting a free app, which is very nice, but that, that the, the, the sort of the kickback is that <coughs> you are acting as a, your movements are being monitored to the extent that there is a download. If this is aggregated, and all that is concluded is that people who, who buy certain types of apps also tend to go to the beach on Sundays or something, <coughs> perhaps that's not particularly uh, concerning. But the question is though, <coughs> are, are there other patterns being formed uh, which are common? So I was talking earlier about neural networks and different things. Uh, so. The, the capability of t technology to, to recognize patterns of data is now very large, and other patterns being formed which would allow, uh, in some sense, a loss of privacy that no longer are you anonymous, but that, that, that a lot is known about you, uh, and the, com the, the combination of your habits is known about you, which could be some, something of concern. <coughs> the, other th the other thing that is that there's mining of things like Twitter, so that you, if your location analysis is turned on on Twitter, uh, <coughs> say this is a nice restaurant and your kid or whatever, uh, once again that's fine. You, you make a tweet, you want the board to hear about it. So if you want them to know you're in that restaurant, that's the whole idea. And, and so that's not in itself a major problem. <coughs> uh, so perhaps some of that's okay. I'm probably less concerned about that maybe than the individual phone thing, which is perhaps more likely to expose your own personal data to the world than, than, than. <coughs> An example of this in Ireland, uh, we have in Dublin a research centre from IBM, which is the Smart Cities Research Centre, who are interested in all of this kind of stuff. And <coughs> they're looking at ways of putting sensors in the city. So some of these are obvious sensors, which is nice to the traffic or something like that. They're interested in determining traffic congestion and things like that, not only directly but from indirect sources, so that they have sensors on, on buses and things like that which cannot be measured. But the other thing which they have is this uh, Twitter, so the modern Twitter feeds to see are people talking about particular traffic jams or particular sort of uh, issues uh, <coughs> that are arising, and they try and see, well, uh, uh, is there any kind of, of so if Twitter says, somebody says there's some kind of traffic jam somewhere, then they, they may look at other data, traffic cameras or something, to see well, what's going on in that place. So that it's, a, it's a way of, so a good deal of Twitter mining is not that live, it's done 
quite, quite a time after the event. This kind of thing is relatively naive and we're looking for uh, particular uh, current events which might be of interest. <coughs> now, there's obviously a lot of this goes on, but it's a form of spatial data capture that you, you it's location based to the extent that uh, it's concerned with is there a particular problem in a particular place and should we do something about it. <coughs> So all of these things, I mean, GeoWiki, which is attempt to, uh, <coughs> obviously the Wikipedia, which provides data, this is an attempt to, if you like, annotate. So it's not so much concerned with the base map as with the understanding of that base data. So <coughs> this is a measure of the uh, of agricultural field size and things like that um, <coughs> in different countries. So uh, this is taken from satellite photography, so satellite photography is an attempt by people to interpret machine to, uh, photography in a sense. So it's making sense out of, so this is a form of uh, spatial data which is collected from, uh, and rather is a form of, of, of volunteer information in a sense. <coughs> this open state map which you probably know something about, but uh, I just follow this brief Right of propaganda. But quite an open street map wasn't started in Britain. And the reason I started in Britain was because of course the cost of data in Britain was high. It would not have started in the US because data in the US government data in the US was, was essentially more cheaply available. So this is a, the edits going on an open street map. So you can see that it's, uh, <coughs> it's gradually filling in the, the, the border in the sense. But if you plot the open street map of data against things like GDP per capita or uh, broadband availability or some other indication of comparative disparity, you'll find that the places which have uh, a lot of people get uh, educated people with sort of uh, mobile devices like phones that can capture data. Uh, or actually lacking this kind of thing, and <coughs> other parts of the world which are, <coughs> are less prosperous uh, are not as white as well as the cover by this sort of, uh, <coughs> sort of provision. So, I mean, it's a... Uh, you know, these things are always good to look at. But, <coughs> so this... Uh, <coughs> This is from Oxford University in, in, in Britain, but it's a measure of the density of open street maps. So <clears throat> there is a sense of which uh, I noticed down on the notice boards by the door, uh, discussion of the digital divide. <clears throat> uh, but the digital divide is also coming into the actual provision of, of uh, crowdsourced uh, spatial data because of course the places which have a lot of the data, uh, Japan, Western Europe, USA, and Canada are precisely those places which <coughs> perhaps have other good sources of data also, and th that those who have get more, and those who perhaps don't have as much data. Uh, but the reason for this is, of course, related to things like uh, broadband availability and so on. If you don't have uh, a computer and a, a, a device that can, can read, a, read a GPS, you can't easily become a volunteer to, uh, to actually contribute to this kind of provision, so <clears throat> it's something which, but the actual provision, the spread of smartphones has, in, in the third world, you know, there's millions of new subscribers who are stream with low-end kind of Android devices which do in fact have these capabilities in, in countries, so perhaps the situation will, will greatly improve over time. <clears throat> so these are the people who are putting together this data. <clears throat> uh, so once again, so the actual difference here is that the people in Europe are doing it and the people in, not, not in the USA are not doing it so much. And the reason why that is, of course, that they don't have to. Because in the USA, much of the government data is freely available and has been uploaded into this kind of open street map framework, so there's no need for people to go around with uh, manually sort of uh, doing it because the government has provided it. Whereas in European countries, until very recently, Governments did not 
contribute free data to people, and so people get uh, alternative sources of data, uh, which is why they're actually uh, uh, strictly enthusiastic in, in, I suppose, in, in somewhat Germanic countries, if you like. <coughs> but uh, so the actual, it started in Britain because the cost of data in Britain was high, and the thing that made this possible was the actual uh, availability of accurate GPS signals after the, the, the military made them available at high resolution to everyone, which made the collection of this type of data possible. <coughs> and so uh, we have a lot of data. The question is, though, <coughs> about this kind of project. There are many potential contributors, so we have, I mean, there's millions or tens of hundreds of thousands of people, many of whom I've only made a few small edits to OpenStreetMap, including myself. I mean, I've done 10 or 20 things on it, in, in which either things I spotted were wrong, or things I particularly, my own neighborhood, I just knew happened to know about something. So there are a few people who spend their days doing this kind of thing. There's other people who do, the, they do a little bit, and then I'll, uh, and there's a few people who register and never, never do anything. But there's obviously the, the people who contribute are one group, but there's a much more select group who are uh, driving the initiative. And the question is, these people are establishing policies. <coughs> so there are issues like the vast majority of people at the policy making end are men. So ladies don't seem to want to get into OpenStreetMap quite as much. And so there's debate over things like there's a very good coverage of, of uh, football fields, but there's not such good coverage of uh, childcare facilities and that kind of thing. <coughs> and some of this has been attributed to an actual bias in the, in, in the set of people. Where we're in the volunteer project, if you don't like what's missing from the map, you're quite free to go in and add it yourself. It's not like a situation where, you're, where you don't have that capability. <coughs> there are obviously quality issues with quality, issues with uh, uh, legal issues. So the legal issues arise from people who, who sort of look at a, uh, somebody else's map and then kind of add in something much the same into, a, into an actual uh, map of the project of this sort. That's a very legally suspect uh, thing in a sense because uh, it's, it's not quite your own work in a way. And also the, the license conditions can be very complex because if you have these kind of projects which create uh, essentially open source uh, maps, and other people then wish to use them in commercial projects, then the actual license of this gets a bit <coughs> tricky. And the people, the open source said they want to have credit and so on, there are problems with this. However, <coughs> all of this work is meaning that somebody's building up an actual complete, accurate, free database of most everything. And <coughs> People like software providers like you know, Esri here in Redland and so on are making the, the tools to, to import this data and so on. So the question is, what implications does this have for the other data sets that are out there? <coughs> the guy that started uh, OpenStreet was a guy called Steve Coast, who subsequently worked for various commercial uh, things. <coughs> and he suggested that, that we're, this is the situation, you know, the, the Open, the open thing only started late, it didn't start 2004, at which time uh, other mapping sources were already up and running. So it took some time to get to a minimum standard. It's now kind of reached this minimum standard that, that, that for many places it's, it's an accurate and reliable source of data. <coughs> Meanwhile, the sort of the commercial uh, closed maps have actually got, got are still ahead, but where, where do we go from here? And one, his suggestion, which isn't quite an unbiased one, <coughs> is that <coughs> if this free sources of data become extremely good, then why, how, how are you going to have uh, continued expensive uh, sources of data that the, <coughs> it's not an Andreas in the sense the, the, the services provided by commercial providers have to become better and better if the free product is getting increasingly good. And if the free product reaches a certain standard, it becomes very difficult for uh, the commercial providers to uh, provide more services which are going to move beyond that point and make it really worthwhile engaging with. <coughs> what they are doing, though, in the form of, of 
convenience yeah, and apps and things like that. They're making uh, things very convenient for people to use essentially commercial services. They're getting the reward in the forms of the involuntary data collection, <coughs> you know, and, and <coughs> so people aren't quite aware of the price they're paying. If you're not aware of the price you're paying, you perhaps don't have the same incentive to think about the implications of using a free product instead. <coughs> So the, this brings us to issues of, of data protection, which it's probably fair to say data protection is a European thing. In, in terms of the European have pushed out the boundary of this in a way which uh, other countries like Singapore and so on have followed along with that. In the US, things have been a little bit more mixed. Uh, California's always tried to do a bit more than, than the US federal government, but, but by and large, I think the perception of those of us who live in Europe is that our data is better protected in Europe than it is in the US. I don't know if that's a valid uh, <coughs> contention or not. <coughs> but in Europe, the law states that you have to obtain and process data fairly for a specified purpose, dispose only of capacity purpose, that be relevant and not excessive, and retain only as long as necessary. <coughs> now, there is a very, very a strong suspicion, in my part at least, that some of the apps and so on that I'm actually clicking on are not really doing, doing, doing these things because I'm not quite sure what they're going to use it for. Really, it's not that clear to me what they're going to use it for. <coughs> uh, I can understand in other cases what, what I'm doing, but in, in, in this case, if I go to my bank and I, I give them my name and address and so on, I, I, I can see reasonably why they want to know this and they want to know something about what, <coughs> uh, secret questions like where were you born or something as to, in order that when you ring them up and say you've lost your credit card that they can actually get it back. <coughs> so all of that has a reasonably clear path between what you tell them and what you believe they're going to do with the data. But with these kind of apps where you know, the key bar and they want to know everything about you, it's not quite clear why uh, an app wants to know the, the state of the battery on my mobile phone. <coughs> what is it doing with that particular data? Now, there is a, an, a, a clause in the general European law that states that only really personal data is protected in this way, so that your mobile phone has no particular right to privacy, only you have, so that if you want to know about the battery in your phone, well, that's okay, and, and that's fair enough. <coughs> but all, other things on your phone, perhaps your contacts. You know, every app wants to get access to your contacts, which is basically the set of people that you, that you phone or whatever, you know, what exactly is the nature of that particular transaction and where is that going? And I think that there's going to be a, a, a lot of agitation, let's say, on this issue in the future because I think that the, the practice of the uh, legalities are not in, in accordance with each other. The practice is rather more, uh, let's say, fair, let's say, than, than, than what the law would suggest. And, in Ireland, sometimes this comes to, to, to us in Ireland because many of the major <coughs> companies have the European headquarters in Ireland so that as far as the European operation is concerned, the actual uh, legal case often takes place in Ireland on these matters. And I think the spatial end of things is something where this is likely to uh, be an area of activity, let's say, in the next, next point. <coughs> And you also think about in California, it seems, uh, I found this out from Google, so uh, some of you may know more about it than I do, but <coughs> there is a bill which has been uh, <coughs> proposed a month ago which, which is concerned with the, the actual uh, notification to customers of how their geolocation information will be used and shared upon installation of the application. Of course, this just may be a big long piece of text that you can kind of down to the bottom of as quickly as possible to, to try and click yes so that you <coughs> because at that time, point in time you want to use the app and you don't really want to, to be reading a lot of, uh, of stuff. <coughs> but <coughs> I still think that it's useful for the actual uh, documentation of where the data is going afterwards. Particularly, and I think this should, should not only be uh, presented to people in the form of some kind of uh, script whenever you sign up, but it should be documented on websites and, and reports and things like that, which perhaps is, is, a, is a level of, uh, <coughs> of revealing that isn't happening at the moment and would 
be very desirable that it would. <coughs> and uh, there's obviously uh, this affirmative consent. In some sense, the problem is not giving up consent for your location, geolocation. You, you, you wish to do something and you perhaps give consent for that particular transaction. The question is, when they then have your data, do they then use it for something which has nothing to do directly with the transaction that you previously, do they sell it on to some advertisers, or do they <coughs> make it available? And if they anonymize the data, perhaps uh, aggregate in some way, that may not be a problem. But there is, a, a <coughs> I think, a need for uh, more transparency in exactly where all of this is going. Because we are providing organizations, we're acting as some paid data providers for a whole variety of organizations. And even though we in this room are well above average in terms of our appreciation of, of geolocation and, and, and so on, we probably don't have any more of a clue about it than anybody else. I certainly don't. So I started to prepare this talk, it makes me worried in one sense. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what to do about it, but uh, so the issue, is really to sort of wrap up in a sense, <coughs> the issue is the technical problems are not the, well, they're very interesting to talk about, they're not the fundamental issue. We can have, we can have a bigger cloud computing and so on, we can store all this stuff, we can eventually uh, document it properly, have meta standards, we can, it takes some time for people to make these connections and to, 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 to do that, but that, that can be done. <coughs> the question is, uh, do people have the motivation to do that? So, <coughs> information is power. That's one of the truisms that, you know, from, from the beginning of human history. If I, have, if I know something and you don't know it, then I have an advantage. That gives me, you have to come to me and ask me for it. Or you have to pay me for it, in another case. So, <coughs> how is all of this going to come together? Uh, why should I give you my data, in a sense? <coughs> uh, there is really a social problem. Uh, not a tactical one as to how all of this is going to be brought together. I'm not sure if anyone can think of this is something to talk about in the discussion. What other area of human activity do we have some sort of sharing taking place in a way which is, <coughs> allows all sorts of different people to share data, which is what we need really in the geolocation space. <coughs> so one thing that would happen would be a micropayment model if you could buy some data and pay for it in a reasonably transparent way. So just as a music download, which <clears throat> music download was the wild west in the sense it was piracy, there was all sorts of things 10, 15 years ago. Once it became possible to buy a piece of music in a reasonably convenient way, you could use your phone credit, you could you know, have your account, and it didn't cost too much. People just bought it because it was easier, in a sense, to do it the right way than do it the wrong way. So likewise, if you could buy a piece of, get access to all sorts of data and, and pay a little bit for it, but actually um, do so in a convenient way, then you probably would. But there is no such uh, obvious model in existence, and uh, it's once again unclear um, how such a thing could come into existence. And there aren't really good examples of this. So if I'm going to one, once again, that would be a good uh, thing to bring this idea forward. Another idea would be contributors' concerns mean that we might throw out our Google Maps and install OpenStreetMaps on our phone and know that uh, at least if the data goes back into the pool that it's not making somebody a lot of money but it's, been, it's simply increasing the availability of data for everyone. So or will we simply, will the commercial providers simply make their apps more convenient than these people have an incentive to make, so that convenience, will, will, will we, are we always happy to trade our privacy for convenience? Yes, probably, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if the open app, if the open sort of data was very convenient, if somebody made it very convenient, some sort of developer somewhere developed something which was extremely convenient <clears throat> and had some some sort of uh, thing then perhaps we, we, it was almost as good as the real thing in the sense that we might think about it at least. So <coughs> uh, that's a challenge for people. And when they, you know, do, we, do we need all of these different world maps? Do we need to have different sorts of, <coughs> you know, your map, on, your map on my, my sat now need to be different than the Google map and so on? Does that need to be different from the OpenStreetMap? 
say nothing of all the different mapping agencies through the world. <coughs> you know, there's only one world, we need to have multiple competing maps of the world, and how many of these do we need, even if we do need more than one? It's, it's, it seems to me that, that there must be some consolidation, or further consolidation in this space, <coughs> as it's not obvious that you need to have multiple data sets. It, it doesn't... <coughs> So one model of this might be that the government agencies might start putting more and more data into the <coughs> crowdsourced types of... <coughs> for example, the government might agree to pay for the, the OpenStreetMap servers, but they're doing it directly because they're hosted in the university, which I suppose is funded by the government in one way or the other, by research funds and different things. But you know, the government might choose to integrate some of its <coughs> data sets into these things and use it as a, as a means of reaching its own citizens through these uh, forms of, of databases and <coughs> provide a service to their citizens that way. This would require a bit of a change of thought by certain European governments, but some of them have moved it out of the way, like places like Denmark <coughs> have actually done a lot of open data, but Denmark is a, and Scandinavian countries generally have a they have a cooperative spirit, which is not always found in, in, in English-speaking countries even uh, in general, so I, I don't know that, that this model is necessarily going to may take a little bit of time to... to uh, so, yeah. well, well, one of the things I'm uh, looking at in Ireland at the moment is we're doing the devising new postcode in Ireland, which is a whole story in its own right, <coughs> But one of the ways in which that's been done is they're creating a database where you essentially need to pay to get into the database, and this is a, a finance model for keeping the thing updated and so on. Now, of course, the government should just say, well, you pay your property tax, and that, with that comes a postcode for your house or whatever, and we use 0.01% of that to, to maintain the database, but that's not the way necessarily that finance, you know, People think they, they, they have a certain sort of view of trying to ensure that these things pay for themselves, and so they, they, they <coughs> may be a bit of a problem in, in, in reaching this point. Okay, so that's really an attempt to put forward issues. I don't know that I've answered the issues, I, I haven't, but <coughs> I think it'd be interesting to hear what people think or where is all this stuff going.